So I'm going to continue with uh, overall transformation rate theory. And just to summarize what we did in the last lecture, uh, we derived the Avrami equation by considering uh, you know, the evolution of particles following a short time period delta t. So supposing we start with two particles at the time t, and those two particles have grown by a certain amount, and we may have nucleated two more particles, then clearly this, this is uh, wrong in the sense that we can't transform in a region which has already transformed. So we correct for that by adding up all these blue regions, whether they are correct or not, and calling that the change in extended volume. We multiply that by the probability of finding untransformed material, and that gives us the true change in the volume fraction of alpha. Okay. Right, now, we take that equation and we integrate it, and therefore we get the real volume fraction as a function of the extended volume fraction. And the big advantage of doing this is that the extended volume fraction is very easy to calculate because you take the nucleation rate multiplied by the time increment that gives you the number of particles that formed in that interval. You take the growth rate uh, and therefore you have the volume of each particle at whatever point it started nucleating. Sum all those up and you've got the extended volume. And then you go through this equation that gives you the real volume fraction. So it's a very, very powerful theory for dealing with uh, transformation kinetics. Now, one problem with this theory, uh, and it's existed for more than 70 years, it's been exploited in so many different applications, but the significant problem with it uh, is that you can deal only with one phase forming at any instant. Okay. Now, if you look at this, this is what happens in steel, which is used in the vast majority of power plants for generating electricity. Okay, so this is a particular steel which is extremely successful and has been used for at least six or seven decades in power stations which have steam temperatures which are very high. The higher the steam temperature, the greater is the efficiency of generation. Uh, so you use less coal for the same amount of electricity. Okay? So we want to go to higher and higher temperatures. And that's the reason why we are trying to theoretically design new steels which can go to even higher temperatures. But the problem is that because these uh, steels have to resist high temperature for a very long time, we have to throw in many kinds of particles in order to resist deformation at high temperature. So that deformation is called creep. So you know, if I load this piece of material at a stress which will not cause plastic deformation ordinarily, but over long periods of time, it will get longer and longer. So if you look at this particular tower next time you go out, then there are lead sheets which line the surface. And you'll see that the old sheets are wrinkled because it's creeping. Okay. But this floor is new. It was recently added. Yeah, there was space underneath this structure because this building won an award because it allows space to flow through. But we filled in the space to create this lecture theater. And it has new lead lining. And that will be completely flat. Okay, so have a look next time you walk up. That is called creep deformation. We need to resist that creep deformation because a power station is designed to last for 25 years at least. And the vast majority of them continue operating up to 40 years. And the thing is rotating at you know, a very high uh, RPM, something like 3,000 revolutions per minute. So the stresses are very large. So here, for example, is the precipitation of a particular compound which is called M3C. M stands for metal atoms, mixture of metal atoms. That precipitate then dissolves during service and you end up with a molybdenum rich uh, carbonitrite here, M2X. And then that starts to dissolve and you form a more stable chromium rich carbide which is called M23C6. And if I carry this calculation on to a million hours, then I will get an even more stable phase forming. So the reason why we don't get the most stable phase forming first is that it's difficult to nucleate. Nucleation depends on interfacial energy. Remember the last lecture? The higher the interfacial energy, the more difficult it becomes to nucleate because the activation energy is higher. 
yeah, the activation energy for nucleation scales with the interface energy cubed. Okay. So the larger the value of sigma, the more difficult it becomes to nucleate. So if a particular crystalline phase has a low interfacial energy, even though it is not the most thermodynamically stable phase, it will precipitate first. And then as the more stable phase precipitates over a longer period of time, it will dissolve because this is the more stable phase, and so on. And you carry this calculation uh, or experimental calculation on for a long time, 40 years. Yeah. Um, what types of factors contribute to the magnitude of the inflation? Very good question. Uh, so, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull a presentation which I gave in the thermodynamics course to illustrate. Okay. <coughs> So there are two components to interfacial energy. One is that you're trying to fit together crystal structures which are in different uh, lattice parameters, okay? And different crystallographic orientations. So you could have the same crystal structure, but a different crystallographic orientation, okay? Now, let's assume these are two different crystal structures. Then the lattice spacing here is different from the lattice spacing here. So you will have to bend these planes, okay? and that's okay to bend those planes when the particle is small, because you can see that when the particle is small, these displacements are smaller, okay? and they become more severe as the particle grows, and until you get a breakdown of what we call coherency. Coherency means there's continuity of lattice planes across the boundary. Okay? So this would have a high interfacial energy, because look, there are defects. Yeah. Which are dislocations. So if you have if you have two different precipitates mm -hmm. where the particle is the same size, yeah, is it just it's just dependent on the actual the structure whether oh. those planes are preserved as coherent or not? Yeah. You see, if if this spacing here is greater for one phase than another, mm -hmm. then breakdown of coherency happens earlier. Yeah, that is more. Yeah. yeah. So that's the structural component mm -hmm. of uh, free energy of interfacial energy. But we've also done another component, which is the chemical component, because the yellow phase might have a different chemical composition from the matrix in which it precipitates. And even if they have perfect crystallographic matching, there's a discontinuity there. And that discontinuity we expressed slightly differently. So this, this is the enthalpy of mixing when we take two crystals, mix them up completely. Okay. So this is the change in binding energy and so forth. Okay. Now, I explained to you that when we put large particles in contact with each other, it's only the atoms at the boundary that see each other. So if I scale the enthalpy of mixing with the thickness of that boundary, then that's a chemical interfacial component. So there are two factors. One is structural, one is chemical. Okay. So the difficulty with uh, ordinary Abrami theory is that it's not able to deal with lots of phases forming at the same time. So what people have done in the past is that they've said, okay, I will artificially stop this reaction at this stage and start this reaction. But that introduces three parameters because you don't know when to stop the reaction and when to start. It becomes a fitting parameter, which makes the theory less useful because you can't generalize it without having those fitting parameters. Right? So let's think about how we could improve a Rami theory so that it deals with multiple reactions, simultaneous transformations, so that the point where this particle starts to dissolve is a natural consequence of the calculation, it's not a fitting parameter. And then we can predict a whole sequence of reactions. 
So does everybody understand the problem? Okay. Right, so we go back to this diagram. We, have two, we are now going to consider the presentation of two phases, alpha and beta, two different phases. And at a time t, we just have two particles of alpha because it's easier to nucleate, perhaps. Okay. And a short time later, the alpha has grown, these dark blue regions, and we've actually precipitated two new particles of beta phase. Now, clearly, this equation is not enough here to represent this situation because we have two phases. So, the problem is actually exactly the same that I really don't want this particle to exist. Okay? Now, how can I modify this equation to take account of the fact that I also have beta? need to take account of the fact that you have beta to work out the probability of forming in untransformed regions. But that still doesn't help me because I have only one equation here. I need another equation, as you said, to represent the beta phase. Okay? So this is what we do. We have two equations here. The increment in alpha is related to the extended volume of alpha and the increment in beta to the extended volume of beta, but the probability of finding untransformed region has both phases. So the equations are coupled, and you solve them simultaneously. Yeah? Now, if you have 10 different phases, you have 10 different equations. And then, you see, as the more stable phase beta forms, it will change the composition of the matrix, and alpha will start to dissolve automatically. You don't have to put in any arbitrary parameters. This has been a very big breakthrough in Avrami theory, in modeling real materials, which have more than one phase precipitating at a time. And, you know, I mean, it is such a trivial modification, it's surprising that nobody spotted it for something like 60 or 70 years. Okay. So this is the original equation, and we have coupled equations to represent more than one phase forming at the same time. And then everything else is exactly the same as in Avrami theory. You need a nucleation function for alpha, you need a nucleation function for beta, you need a growth rate function for alpha, and a growth rate function for beta, in order to calculate the extended volume of beta and the extended volume of alpha. Yeah, everyone happy with that? And you can see that they are truly simultaneous reactions. Okay, so this is a calculation using those two equations, that alpha is all evolving and at, at the same time beta is evolving. You're not arbitrarily saying, okay, you start evolving at this time and stop, and then beta starts precipitating, but they're forming together. And indeed, the graph that I showed you for the power station steel, this is a calculation in which we are not saying that you start dissolving here. That is a natural consequence of the fact that the composition of the matrix is changing. because the precipitate is richer or poorer in solute than the matrix. So it's very, very easy to modify our Rami theory to take account of simultaneous reactions. And you will only find this theory in one book, which is my book. <laughs> okay, so we have simultaneous transformations solved, so let's uh, continue. Um, each of Rami equation gives you the evolution of volume fraction as a function of time, temperature, driving force, diffusion coefficients, right? So it represents one curve at a particular temperature. And if you plot those curves as a function of temperature, then we generate what we call an isothermal transformation diagram or a time temperature transformation diagram. It's the same, same terminology. Now, that's great, and we can do that when we have several different kinds of precipitates. We just have different curves for different kinds of precipitate on the same diagram. But the vast majority of problems in industry involve continuous cooling transformation. 
not isothermal transformation because when you have large components, you can't suddenly cool them rapidly to another temperature and hold at a constant temperature. You will get inhomogeneous temperature within your component, right? So the natural thing to do is to cool continuously. And we need to think about how to relate this diagram, which is an isothermal transformation diagram, to a continuous cooling transformation diagram. So a continuous cooling transformation diagram would, would be generated by taking your sample, allowing it to cool, measuring the temperature at which reaction starts, and measuring the temperature at which reaction stops. And you plot those points as a function of time, and you get a diagram which looks very similar to the isothermal transformation diagram, but it's displaced. Okay. Now, you can calculate the isothermal transformation diagram using your Avrami theory. Yeah. How can we convert that into a continuous cooling transformation diagram? Well, let's have a look at this. This is the isothermal transformation diagram. And this is for 5% transformation, 10% transformation, and we can have any curve like that from our sigmoidal curve. So we are plotting psi versus time, and you get a curve which looks something like this. And all we are doing is measuring the time at 5% and at 10%. And I could plot several of these curves if I wanted to for any fraction of transformation, right? I want to convert this now into continuous cooling. I want to find out at what point will I get 5% transformation if I cool according to this curve. So it's no longer isothermal. I'm not going to rapidly cool it here and hold it. So any ideas how I could do that? So there's a hint on the slide. We are varying the temperature continuously here. Yeah? So it's a finite, finite steps. steps. I mean, this curve is like holding at this temperature for a small amount of time, holding at this temperature for a small amount of time, and at this temperature for a small amount of time. Yeah? And obviously, for the purposes of illustration, I've taken these to be large steps, but I can make them as small as I like to get higher and higher accuracy. Yeah. So if this is my cooling curve, temperature versus time, there's nothing to stop me from making these steps as small as I like. Okay? You know, you've got computers and you can make them one degree or you can make them ten degrees. So what I'm going to do is take this complete uh, take this cooling curve and treat it as a whole series of isothermal steps. Okay. Whole series of isothermal heat treatments. And this uh, process starts at the point where we are at the equilibrium temperature where the driving force is zero. Because transformation can only happen below the equilibrium temperature. Yeah? Now, let's examine this particular step. Okay. So, According to this discretization of the cooling curve, I'm spending a time delta T i at this temperature, okay, for the i -th step, if you like. Spending a short time delta T at this temperature. Now, in order to achieve 5% transformation, I actually need that much time. Okay. So, if I take the fraction delta Ti divided by Ti, then that's less than the time required to achieve 5% transformation. But I can say it's, supposing this is equal to, say, 0.06, then I can say it's 6% towards achieving this value of transformation, right? That's straightforward? I need to hold for this time to get 5% transformation, but I've held for a lot less than that. So I'm only a fraction of the way towards achieving the required amount of transformation. Okay, yeah, you happy? Okay, but then I'm going to another temperature and holding. Okay. So let's say this is delta T1. 
at the second temperature, delta T2, over T2, I've spent 0.09 of the way towards achieving 5% transformation. Okay. Now, if I add all these up and they come to 1, that's the beginning of 5% transformation. So if I add all these terms, the point where I reach 5% transformation is delta Ti over Ti equals 1. Okay? Yeah, Ti is changing all the time. Uh, sorry, I should have made that as a number, 1 and a 1. So I add up all the bits of isothermal steps. When the sum equals 1, I have 5% transformation. Yeah. So, um, how about you are saying um, the, the process actually divides into uh, many, many uh, subject process? Mm -hmm. so That's right. So we are treating continuous cooling as a full series of isothermal steps. Now, that's the same equation as I've written on the board. When that value equals 1, I can say that I've achieved 5% transformation by continuous cooling. What's the mean isothermal? So th this is what we've derived from our, our Rami theory, or done in experimental measurement. So it's exactly the same as this diagram, which was I'm showing you. So we call this, there are two terminologies. One is isothermal transformation diagram, or time temperature transformation diagram. Isothermal is better because it tells you exactly that you're supercooling your parent phase to this temperature very rapidly, and then holding. And at this point, things start, and at this point, the finish. So obviously this means that one reaches the first curve somewhere in the curve. Mm. Doesn't matter what. Um, because it's going to be a, obviously some arbitrary time to reach that. Yeah, that, yeah, that that's right, that's right. So, so for a particular cooling curve, we work out the temperature at which transformation starts and we plot it. Okay. Then we have another cooling curve and it will be a different temperature and so on until you end up Oops. with this diagram, which is a continuous cooling transformation diagram. So for this cooling curve, transformation starts at this point, and it finishes at this point. For this cooling curve, it starts at this point, finishes at this point. For an even slower cooling rate, it starts there and finishes there. So this is no longer isothermal transformation. You plot your cooling curve onto the diagram, and you get the point where reaction starts and finishes or any particular percentage of reaction. Okay, so this is a continuous cooling transformation diagram, which is derived from the isothermal transformation diagram. So is it possible to reach any level of transformation? Yeah, I mean, you know, you've got the whole of the curve. So you've got this. So you can pick the level of transformation for which to plot this curve. Yeah. So we, I mean, we're taking longer now because we're cooling down. Mm -hmm. So I wonder whether we, we can really reach any, 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 any level of transformation. Yeah, if you choose your cooling conditions correctly, you can reach any level of transformation. Okay. The ultimate being the slowest possible cooling. Oh, that's what I was going to ask. Correct yeah. meaning very slow. Yeah, that would be you achieve equilibrium at each temperature. Yeah. So everyone happy with how to convert isothermal transformation to continuous cooling? Yeah. Now, there is a catch in this. Okay. We are assuming that the reaction has only one variable changing with temperature. Now, supposing the diffusion coefficient and something else with a different activation energy changing with temperature, we ne may not be justified in adding this and this together. Okay. Now, reactions where we can do this are known as isokinetic. 
That means that if I take the moving of the precipitate forming at a certain temperature, I can represent transformation at another temperature by speeding that movie up or slowing it down. If that is true, then I can use this method. So if we have a single thermally activated term in our equation, then this is rigorously justified. If not, it is an approximation. So it is quite amazing, you know? We've covered nucleation theory, we've covered growth theory, and we've done a calculation of one of the most important kinds of diagrams that is used widely in industry for working out heat treatments. Yeah. Any questions? Yeah, no. You also make an assumption that as you change the concentration of the components, the rate of crystallization of each component is independent of, of the other one. No, we are not making that because in our equations for for nucleation and growth, we have only dealt with binary theory, right? Binary. Uh, and if you remember, We had uh, an equation which says that the, uh, supposing this is a phase growing, okay? So this is gamma and this is alpha. We are plotting concentration uh, x versus distance, okay? Distance z. And in this case, alpha is solid depleted. So we're getting a build-up of solids in the gamma. Then we had a, an equation which says that the rate at which solute is being rejected is the velocity of the minus x gamma alpha here and x alpha gamma okay, that's the rate at which solute is being rejected as the particle grows must be equal to the diffusion flux down here yeah? if you are going to maintain these two points constant so that must be equal to the diffusion coefficient times the gradient of concentration at this point which is dx by dz at the position of the interface here. That's the so that's a binary case. Now, if I have a ternary case, and we've done this only slightly when we were doing the irreversible thermodynamics, then for a ternary case, I would have to write two of those equations. So I write the velocity of the interface times x gamma alpha for component one minus x alpha gamma for component 2 must be equal to the diffusion coefficient of component 1 times the gradient of component 1, okay? Plus the diffusion coefficient of component 1 as it is affected by the gradient of component 2. So this is dx2 by dz, dx2. Remember that we can have a flux of carbon when there's a gradient of manganese. Yeah? Just like we can have a temperature generated by a gradient of voltage. And I would have to have another equation here for the second component. normal term and this is the interaction between one and two. And we can write a whole series of equations if we have six or seven components. So that goes back to your growth theory. We just have to modify the growth theory for multi-component diffusion. And similarly, when we work out driving forces, it won't be for a binary solution, but it'll be for, you know, more complicated. But these are details, you know. We can do those calculations. 
I just missed, what, what is the, um, act, the TI and the isothermal transformation yep. you represent? Yeah. So, so this, this diagram is constructed by doing a calculation of the, do either a calculation or a measurement of the evolution of volume fraction as a function of time. So if I take that curve and I plot it at a certain temperature, I get these two points or any point in between. Okay. I do that at another temperature, then the kinetics are different, so I have these points. And I generate isothermal transformation diagram. So it's taken by supercooling the parent phase, holding it at that temperature, and getting this curve. Okay. Now I'm going to take the same diagram and plot it here. And I'm saying the start of the reaction is about 5% reaction. I could do it for 10%, I could do it for 95%, or 100%. I want to now convert this diagram into continuous cooling transformation. If, if this was isothermal, it would take that much time for the reaction to start. Okay? But I'm only holding it at that temperature for this. So the fractional amount I've achieved is this divided by this. Okay? When that becomes 1, I've actually got this much transformation. You, know, you can imagine that if I'm doing isothermal reaction, if delta Ti over Ti is 1, yeah, then delta Ti is Ti. Yeah? So when it equals 1, okay, I've got 0.05 of reaction. Well, then the cooling curve would essentially just be a line. Yeah, exactly. So it illustrates that this should be 1 when I achieve the right amount of transformation. But we are going to use it in continuous cooling. That means we are going to add up these bits at different temperatures. So in this summation, I'm not doing isothermal. I'm spending a certain amount of time, which is less than Ti at this point, And I'm spending another amount of time, which is still less than the new Ti. Okay. And that you begin summing the delta Ti as soon as the super grows. So. Exactly. As soon as you go below the equilibrium temperature. It doesn't make sense to have it above that because it can't transform. So if you like, about that, this is infinite anyway. Good question. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't quite understand the last picture. Mm -hmm. This one? Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, you say um, the, the cooling curve across the, yeah. the line curve, and uh, it's the beginning of the... This is the point. This point for the beginning of transformation, where delta Ti over Ti equals 1. Uh, so so the, uh, the beginning of transformation doesn't, doesn't have from the, the beginning of the cooling. Yeah, below the equilibrium temperature. Oh, okay. yeah, because above it, you can't get any transformation. Okay. This is actually the equilibrium temperature. Okay. 